Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on lives saved and lessons learned during real-world aerial search and rescue missions. Before we begin, please be sure to mute yourself just to eliminate any background noise during the webinar. Also, we will be covering three different search and rescue missions today, so if you think of any questions on that specific mission, please feel free to submit your questions in the chat section on your screen, and we will answer them as we wrap up each mission. And if you can't think of any questions at that time, don't worry, we will also be holding a general Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So I'm sure many of you have already heard that drones are transforming the way search and rescue teams are conducting missions. Whether it's lost hikers, trapped skiers, missing children, etc., time is critical during these situations. And from daytime search and rescue to night operations aided by thermal imaging, lives are being saved, response time is being reduced, and teams on foot are being assisted by this technology. So today, as I mentioned, we'll be covering three real-world aerial search and rescue missions to give everyone a solid understanding of what it's really like launching these time-sensitive missions. And today's speaker, who has actually conducted all of these missions, is Mike Uleski. Mike is an active sergeant with the Public Safety Department in Florida, where he is cross-trained as a law enforcement officer, firefighter, and EMT. He has 20 plus years of extensive aviation experience with a bachelor's degree in aeronautical sciences from Embry-Riddle and a commercial pilot certificate with single engine, multi-engine, and instrument ratings. He is also the supervisor and chief pilot for his agency's drone program, as well as Dart Drone's chief public safety flight instructor. So we have a lot of information to share in today's webinar, and I will pass it over to Mike and we'll get started. Uh, <clears throat> this initial call, mission number one, this was a wayward kayaker, and we ran this mission in early April uh, this year. The initial call was a cell phone call from a uh, kayaker that uh, reported he was about one mile offshore of the Daytona Beach area, and uh, thankfully he was able to see the Dunlawton Bridge, if anyone happens to be familiar with the Daytona area, but uh, the cell phone call was very broken up since he was a mile offshore at ground level. He was starting to get into that where he really didn't have a solid cell service. So he finally reports in, I'm offshore. It was a very, very strong west wind blowing that day. So he was not able to get back. And he says, I'm exhausted, I need help. So uh, I met with uh, their initial dispatch came out to our uh, beach safety, which is our standard way we would handle something like this. Uh, beach safety is going to launch a jet ski. Just by chance, there was an FWC boat in the area, which is Florida uh, Wildlife Commission. So they happened to be the, in the area as well as an additional resource. And then beach safety remembered that we have a UAS program and we were already responding anyways. So we all met at the Dunlawton Beach approach and we went over a real quick game plan because the search area was fairly immense. We knew he could see the beach approach but he was not able to, during that call, tell us if he was north or south. So that made it really difficult to understand from the beach a mile out, and he could be anywhere from a mile north to a mile south. So we put together a real quick plan, and we figured we're going to let the boats go north because that's actually where FWC was as they were already in the north sector. But we split the sectors up um, one for one. So I was going to take the south sector with the, the drone, North sector was going to be handled by jet ski and boat. So we immediately start to get set up, and this is only about seven minutes after the initial call. So from the time that he called in, dispatch receive it, dispatch process it, and send it out, we're now seven minutes in to this call. So jet ski gets to be launched. I'm launching at about the same time, and we were using our agency's uh, Inspire 1, which is a standard Inspire 1 version 2. Uh, TB48 or TB48 battery, so we got about uh, 18 minutes on a good day of battery time, and uh, we went with a visual camera, just a standard X3, because we figured it's a fairly clear day, the water is fairly clear, visual camera is going to give us the best option for the day. So we launch, and for this one, for my planning, I'm thinking about what type of search pattern am I going to use, what's my environmental conditions, what's my aircraft capability. I did have a visual observer for the day, which was a bonus because he's actually another member of our unit. So he's very, very familiar with our operations. So I told him, I want you to watch this thing and I'm going to go out as far as I can that you can still see it. 
because uh, we knew that the guy saying he's approximately one mile out. So we're talking in the 5,000 to 6,000 foot range. So my VO had very clear instructions. He's standing right next to me. So communications was not an issue. He was watching the aircraft the entire time. So we go to launch and I'm thinking my best bet is I'm going to go out as far as I possibly can and then work my way in. Wind this day was blowing from the west at 17, gusting to 25 miles per hour. That's pretty healthy winds. I know that is gonna drastically affect my flight time. So I need to go and really be careful of how much time I'm burning for the distance that I'm at. So we head out actually parallel with the jet ski. And once we get out to 6,000 feet, 6,200 feet is where the uh, visual observers start to say, I'm, that's about as far as you can go for me. Uh, jet ski turned north. I turned south and we started what we call parallel sweep. So essentially lawnmower pattern. Uh, we wanna keep our speed fairly low. So that way we're not moving all that fast. That way we can process what we see moving underneath the aircraft. Video was absolutely crystal clear the entire time, no video issues. And the biggest thing you also wanna think about is altitude selection. Because the altitude is gonna control how wide of an area you can cover but you also have to take that into relation as to the resolution of the camera that you have. Because higher that you go, the more area you can cover, but the lower resolution that you get. In this case, I'm looking over a flat open ocean, fairly calm day. It actually wasn't all that bad. Anytime we get a west wind, it actually knocks down the, the waves considerably. And I'm looking for a bright yellow kayak. That's going to show up. So we figured I can search faster and I can search higher. So my initial altitude that I was looking at, I went up to 380 feet. We were in uncontrolled class golf airspace, no issues with that. And I had my visual observer set. And we started doing our lawnmower pattern back and forth, back and forth. And we started out at 6,200 feet. That's a long way out over water. And if you are anywhere near the ocean, that's the kind of operations that we're now running on a fairly regular basis. So we started working our pattern and we're working ourselves in. I got about 15 minutes out of the or battery total, but I'm watching my time come down and it's time to come back. So we break off search. I notify dispatch drone is coming back for a battery change, fly straight back home, land, put in a new battery, and then utilize the moving map to essentially go right back to where I stopped and restart my program. So we continue the search back and forth, back and forth. About this time, the FWC boat happens to notify us that he sees something on the horizon in the north sector, actually in the very far north end of the sector. And uh, he gets, happens to just run across and here's our, our kayaker. And sure enough, he's about 6,400 feet offshore. And he was about three quarters of a mile north of where we split the line. As soon as we went out off of the beach approach, he was three quarters of a mile north of that. So as they're making the way towards them, basically they asked me, hey, can you come over just for an aerial, make sure we don't have anybody else in the area. So I basically turn to the north and start heading out towards them. So visual observer, he's like, okay, I can still see you, you're good. We go over top. That's the only kayaker. They make contact with the kayaker. And he says, I'm the only one out here, I'm exhausted. So they start rescue operations from there. I'm still watching my time because now I'm significant distance from shore. I've got a significant wind coming out of the west for a headwind. And now I need to see when I'm going to come back. So as I start coming back, I'm watching my ground speed and I'm essentially getting about 20 to 24 miles per hour, which I wasn't real comfortable with. Uh, Definitely a little bit on the, the slower side, and that's simply because of the headwind. Anyone on this uh, call that's ever flown the Inspire, it's a fairly quick aircraft, but when it's fighting a wind, that's going to take away from your airspeed. So uh, I did go into attitude mode, and my speed immediately jumped from 22 miles per hour to 34 miles per hour and made it home without any issue, no issues from there. The uh, total time elapsed from the moment that he called our dispatch got the initial call to when we actually found him was just over 20 minutes. So that was a very, very quick find on that side. Uh, so let's go on to uh, lessons learned. That was the mission. And now we'll go on to uh, some of the stuff that we learned. Uh, biggest thing was that the drone was a big help being able to split the search sector. Even though the drone was not what actually found the kayaker, 
being as we were able to take that, that literally mile out by two mile wide search area and break it down into 50% for surface search versus aerial search, it really went and simplified it on the beach side. Um, also, I was able to go and do overwatch on their side when they're actually going and looking at them. So that, that greatly helped with that. Uh, the altitude, uh, again, very, very important. And uh, one thing that I do uh, with any of my aircraft that get utilized for search and rescue, and this is actually part of what I teach the, uh, the pilots that fly on my side, is uh, understanding altitude versus field of view of how much area am I actually covering over the ground. And uh, anyone that wants to dredge up a little bit of their uh, high school trigonometry, uh, it's actually not all that difficult. Uh, if you take your field of view of the camera, uh, for this instance, we'll say that it happens to be, um, we'll say uh, Inspire 1 with an X3 has a 94 degree field of view. And we want to split that in half because we need a right angle. So we're going to say 47 degrees. Take the tangent of that and you get about 1.07. And this will work on any camera. And you multiply that tangent, that number that comes out by your altitude, whatever your altitude happens to be. So for this case, we'll say that it's at 100 feet. So at 100 feet, I can see my field of view. One half of my field of view is going to be roughly about 100 feet. 107 is really what it comes out to be. So I now have to multiply that by two and go back to my original field of view of 94 degrees. So at 100 feet, I can actually cover about 214 feet across the ground. And then that number is obviously going to increase as we go up in altitude. But it makes it simple as a search and rescue person to be able to understand how high am I and how much of the ground can I cover. Again, this was open ocean. There's not a whole lot of stuff down there. I'm looking for a bright, bright yellow target. That's not a hard thing to find. I was able to actually go up to that high altitude where I was covering probably close to 800 feet, 850 feet across each path as I'm going up and down. So that worked out really well. And uh, we'll actually be having that uh, formula. So that way, if you're ever looking for it uh, and anyone has any questions, just contact me. Uh, aircraft performance. Definitely not a day that I would put a Mavic out there. Uh, this was in Inspire territory or even Matrice 200, 210 platform. Uh, fairly heavy winds. And as, as I said, anyone that's flown in Inspire, they know it's fairly quick uh, to go from what we're used to at 40 to 45 miles an hour as a standard cruise to 22 is your absolute maximum is slow. So when you start getting into these more extreme distances, you really have to understand aircraft capability. You have to get out there and fly the aircraft in all kinds of different weather conditions. What is it going to do in this wind condition? What if the wind's coming from the south? Am I going to adjust my search pattern based upon the wind direction? On this one, as uh, we did this parallel sweep, that's why we went as far out as we possibly could and worked in. Because then at least I'm going out with the maximum amount of battery that I have. And I can kind of watch my time. How long did it take me to get from the beach to my initial starting point? How much time did it take to get there? And how much time should I balance to be able to get back to the beach safely and not actually go and lose that time from there? It happened to, to really work out. I landed with about 17% battery on the pack. So I was within my safety guidelines, a little less than I was comfortable with. But uh, the attitude mode worked great. And, and that's something that I always stress in all my classes. Be comfortable flying in attitude mode because it's there for a reason. It's a great for an emergency type of thing. But anyone flying in attitude mode, it shouldn't be a, oh, no, what do I do type of thing. It's going to drift. It should simply be, well, now I got to work a little bit harder. So everything with this one went absolutely great from beginning to end, even though we weren't the, the ones that I would have loved to have been the one to find them on that one. But at least being able to split that rather than Beach Patrol having to split up their units with FWC to search that same area, we were able to do it at a higher altitude and cover a much larger area. Uh, my area actually in my total flight time of about 17 minutes, we had covered the entire south sector. And that was a one square mile area in less than 20 minutes. That's a huge amount of area to be able to search in that period of time. Um, okay, next one. Uh, this was a search, uh, not necessarily so much of a rescue. Uh, we definitely wanted to rescue him, but that was basically to put him in jail. 
Uh, we do fly a lot. My agency, we fly a lot for suspect search. Uh, normally on the ground, uh, typically on short range. Uh, vehicle traffic will we'll trace them through a neighborhood. Uh, but we have a lot of people that just commit a crime and then take off running, and we get a decent idea of their description. We get a decent idea of their direction of travel. So this was something similar. Uh, basically, we had a shoplifting that occurred at one of our uh, Dollar Generals, and suspect took off running towards the back of the store, so they were heading west. And this is a uh, residential suburban area, so it's fairly uh, congested. A lot of houses, a lot of businesses, so a lot of stuff to look for over the ground. So response was fairly simple. Uh, essentially, we knew what was going on. They called out that it was a white male. He had a gray shirt on. He had dark hair, but that was about it. And those in law enforcement know that's typically about all the description that we typically get. So for this one, uh, we went up there. The UAS unit we set up outside of the initial perimeter, uh, primarily because we don't want to get mixed up because we did have canine come out. And if you're in, especially if you've ever been on a law enforcement search, you never want to mix yourself in with canine. Canine has their own job to do. So anytime you are setting up on a law enforcement side, you do want to be on that outside of the perimeter. You don't want to get yourself set up where you're, you're inside of that operational area. So we went uh, operational from there. Uh, we had about a 15 minute time lapse at this time from the time that the uh, call came in to when we actually launched the aircraft itself. And uh, one of the things that we do talk about sometimes, depending on your, your search, is the legalities of what you're doing. Certain states have certain laws. Uh, recently, North Carolina finally changed theirs to where you can now utilize a thermal camera. There for a while, for whatever reason, North Carolina did not want any unmanned aircraft flying with thermal sensors. Uh, it, finally, they changed that. Uh, you do have to understand what you can and cannot do. In Florida, we happen to deal with a law called the Unwarranted Surveillance Act of 2015. And that limits law enforcement's use for evidence collection. And typically, if it's just standard evidence collection, we do need a warrant. Or what we're able to operate under is called an exigent circumstance, which is going to be a fleeing suspect, destruction of evidence, something along those lines. And uh, for those of you that are listening that are not active law enforcement uh, officers or doing this underneath of that, if you are contacted to operate underneath of another agency, so let's say that your police department has actually contracted you to fly for them, you are still bound uh, by the same regulations under them. So if it's something that they want to use as evidence, just because you are not a sworn member, they're still not able to go and do that. So just be aware that if they are, con sometimes the police departments don't actually understand that. Um, so it's not necessarily that you're violating any rules. It's just a matter of if they try to use that information for evidence, it's not going to be possible dependent on state law. So make sure you understand what each state happens to have because it does change state by state. Uh, weather conditions. It was a nice day, uh, suburban neighborhood area. So lots of houses, lots of sheds, lots of fences. It's a very tough area to search. We've all seen the videos where they find the, the hunter or the child out in the woods. That's that's a fairly easy search sometimes uh, compared to residential where people can go and hide under carports and they can move from place to place and try and conceal themselves. Uh, search area, what we were worried about was about a half mile west of the store hits the intercoastal waterway. And that's basically just a river that runs north and south. So it separates our city from the mainland. Uh, but we do find a lot of people who are fleeing from us. They do head towards the water. That's a large problem for us. So. That was where we started at. So we launched the aircraft, same aircraft, DJI Inspire 1. We started out with the visual camera primarily because we did have a very good um, image of what the person looked like. We knew it was a white male, dark hair, gray shirt. I've got something to work on. So we, we start working the search pattern north and south, north and south. And uh, one issue that we had was that ground units would see somebody and then they would ask us to go and investigate. And one thing that's really important in search in general, even with the first mission, is coverage. You don't want to fly a search pattern over top and then realize that you missed this location. You want to basically go and fly your pattern 
following those rules of the field of view, how much area am I covering, what speed is appropriate. But you really want to make sure that there's not an area that happens to be missed uh, for any type of search because that might be where that person happened to be and that was the one area that you just didn't happen to go over. So we were initially doing our search by visual and one thing you'll find if you do happen to do a search and just because we were looking for a suspect in this one, this could be a four-year-old child that wandered out of their house. This could be an Alzheimer's patient that wandered out of their house. Suburban searches happen and they are much, much more difficult than in a search where we have more of a rural type area, whether it's a desert or more of a forest type of environment primarily because there's so many places for that person to hide. So my main considerations is I'm thinking about altitude. I think I have that on the next slide, Alicia, if you happen to go to that. I'm worried about what uh, resolution, because now in the first mission, I'm looking for a very, very distinctive target. Not a problem, I'm looking down, I can see that. Now I gotta bring that aircraft down because I need more resolution because if this person is hiding underneath of a tree or hiding somewhere that's relatively concealed, I want to be able to have that better resolution to see. So with this one, we actually chose 150 feet and uh, it was in controlled airspace. Half of my city does lie in the uh, controlled airspace, Class Charlie airspace at Daytona International Airport. And we have a simple airspace authorization for it. We just, like most people have a wide area, that's essentially how we run. And uh, we started doing our search passes from the river and then we started working back towards the store. So. Similar to the other one, we went to our extents of where that person is. So short of him swimming across the river and coming back, that's about where we're gonna find him. So we start working back towards the store. And uh, after we ran visual, we did a couple passes visual, we decided, well, let's throw the thermal on and just see if he happens to be concealed because we did have some wooded areas that were uh, mixed in about. And uh, this is where the limitations of thermal kind of come in. Thermal works very well at night. We've all seen those images where the person just literally pops out of the scene and that's where they are. During the day though, this was a sunny day, light clouds, everything was thermally baked. For This uh, actually occurred at about one in the afternoon. Everything lit up. Very, very difficult. Not to say that the thermal was not a tool that we utilized. We actually found a lot of people. Um, most of them though, the difficulty is now on a thermal image is that I don't have any description. Everyone that has a thermal image literally looks like a blob. So the whole white male, dark hair, gray shirt kind of goes out the window. So now I actually have to direct a unit when I would see a person that was working in their yard that looked like they were concealed below the trees. I actually had to send a unit out there to be able to go and determine is that the person that we're looking for? So uh, for this day, we'll go into the next one, uh, next slide for uh, what did we learn? And with this one, we did have an extended time lapse. So the search area in all reality, we later learned the clerk was off by about a half hour. Uh, so our total time lapse was about closer to a half hour, which uh, the person literally could have been miles away at that point in time. But the search went very well. Uh, we were able to go overhead, we were able to find a significant amount of people, but uh, proper selection of your launch and landing area, make sure that you're outside of that. Essentially, if you are law enforcement, don't put yourself into a issue where situational awareness, because it's going to be reduced simply because you're now conducting search operations. Try to be on the outside of that perimeter, because you don't want to be mixed in to where, especially from what we've seen recently with ambush tactics and stuff like that, we, we don't want to put ourselves into that kind of danger. Uh, understand your state law, so then that way you know what you can and cannot do. Uh, the thermal did work relatively well, but we were definitely a force multiplier. With us overhead, we were able to track the canine team. We were able to help them when they were, before entering a backyard, we were able to actually go and search that backyard aerial for them so they knew what they were walking into. Uh, we did locate the subject two days later. We actually put out an attempt to identify and uh, we did have pictures of him. So he was arrested uh, eventually. And uh, the lower altitude definitely worked out much, much better. The, uh, the 150 foot versus the, the higher altitude, we were able to really drill down. We utilized the 2X digital zoom on the uh, Zenmuse X3, so then that way we could really zoom in. And uh, it worked out really, really well. We still ended up the job from there. So uh, the entire mission ran relatively well.
so with that, do we have any questions on uh, on that one? Mike, someone asked if you are flying with a night coa yet. Yes. Um, essentially, we have a 107.29 daylight waiver. Um, it is attached to our airspace authorizations, and uh, primarily because the the coa side, it works very well. We like to have 107 for flexibility because sometimes it does give us a little bit of operations and uh, one thing we are working on is the uh, narrative so if anyone does have any questions about the 107.29 night waiver um, the night waiver that I came up with is actually being used by about uh, my best guess is about a dozen and a half to two dozen agencies across the country now so anyone that is interested in having assistance getting that please contact us and I will get in touch with you <clears throat> and it also includes the uh, visual observer PIC quiz that is now required per the FAA. So we can get you set up with that as well. Okay, this kind of goes to our training, um, kind of give you an idea of what we do um, from dark drones that uh, when we do conduct a search and rescue course. Um, we're going to go over here in a couple minutes, basically what our, our curriculum looks like. But our second half of our search and rescue is actually a real world scenario search and rescue mission. Uh, we take a human form, we put clothes on it, I put it out there somewhere, and essentially that is going to be our setup. So that way the people actually get to go and experience what does a human form look like from 100 feet? What does it look like from 200? What's it look like from 300? Uh, what about human behavior and putting all that together? So with this one, uh, this was one we recently did, and uh, I was working with a, uh, an agency. They were doing our SAR training, and we, we set it up just like what you would get from a law enforcement or a fire call. So with this one, this batch gets a call, and they get a call from a worried mother who says her adult son was supposed to walk along a road to their grandmother's house, and and uh, he was supposed to be there 15 minutes ago and hadn't shown up. Uh, so she's worried because it turns out the individual is 33 years old. He is a high functioning autistic individual. So I like to bring in that whole behavioral side because those of us in public safety know that that's a lot of times what we do end up trying to locate our uh, developmentally disabled young children Alzheimer's patients, it adds a little quirk to it because now you have to understand the behavior of what that person happens to have. So fairly simple call out. And uh, where this location happened to be was a area of pine scrub. So the pines were probably about 20 feet tall, spread out about five acres. There was a road running along the western side. And then there were a series of ponds uh, spaced out within the, the pine area. So uh, that's what they get. That is what the team happens to get. We usually break them down into uh, groups of two or three, and they get an initial call, and then they have to do everything from initial weather planning to area planning, uh, selection of flight uh, positions, who's going to be the PIC, who's going to be the visual observer, who's going to be the assistant observer. They have to go through the entire thing, and then I play the role of the reporting person to essentially say, okay, interview me and I'll give you what information I have. So with this, they had a white male. He was about six foot tall, wearing a bright blue shirt, black pants, and that he hasn't been seen for 15 minutes, but we had a starting point and we had an ending point. So weather conditions, relatively nice day, light winds. It was a daylight search. Uh, they had several aircraft to pick from. They had a, a DJI Mavic. They had a Phantom 3 and a Phantom 4, and then also a DJI Inspire and everything from aircraft selection, which is the best sense. They had options to use a thermal sensor if they wanted to use a thermal sensor. They had a lot of options. So this was their general search area. Uh, then we went out to staging where they were set up right behind the agency parking lot where we happened to, uh, to start at. So if you give me the next slide, Alicia. So they had to pick a search pattern. And when we do our uh, aerial search and rescue training, uh, we go over different types of search patterns. And some are a lawnmower, some are an expanding square. And these are all based off of traditional aerial search patterns used for manned aircraft. The biggest difference is, is that we're taking it down to a slightly smaller scale because we don't have as much flight time, we don't have as much distance ability, but we still can do the same thing. We're just doing it a little bit smaller. 
So with this one, what they chose was called a parallel track, and that's because they knew that the individual was supposed to go from point A at his mother's house to point B at his grandmother's house. So they had a place to start. What the parallel track allows is for them to search that general area, that line, and then start expanding left and right of that line to see where the individual may have gone off of the path at that point in time. So they did a really good job on that. They picked the DJI Mavic, which is a good option, primarily because you get a little bit of added flight time, 27 minutes. All they needed was the visual camera, has 2x digital zoom capability, so it worked out very well for them. They chose 100 foot altitude, so then that way they had very good image resolution. And because of the, spot, uh, the pine scrub, it worked out very, very well because there were so many trees, you really had to look into the little spots here and there to be able to try and see a target. Uh, one thing that did kind of interest me was they had a, a mobile visual observer. So they sent him out uh, to go onto the opposite side of the pine to go and see uh, on the inside. So now they had a visual observer where the pilot was and then a visual observer on the far side. Again, very good option because now it opens up how far they can actually go. So they started doing their parallel track. It's going very, very well. And then the, the mobile visual observer calls out, I think I see something in the trees uh, you might want to take a look at. So the pilot broke off of his search pattern and then goes and he flies over to where the visual observer is. And this exchange took place between the two of trying to communicate what direction the visual observer was looking in to go and direct the pilot to look in that same direction. And it almost became kind of like the telephone game. It, it very quickly went where, okay, I'm looking that way. And what it came from is that they were talking about different electrical boxes they saw on the ground and they were referencing them as visual landmarks. The problem was there was two of them and the visual observer was looking at one and the remote pilot in command was looking at another and they were, it got very, very discombobulated. Uh, the other thing that we do when we do this training is they only get one battery, uh, primarily because we want to go and introduce that stress to see how far they can go and push this and understand when they do need to recover the aircraft and what they, how to be efficient. So they only got a certain amount of flight time. So they started playing this look here, look there, and they had a really good option was once he went and decided that the visual observer sees something, I need to go see what he sees, is he went over to the visual observer and he started another type of search pattern called a pie search. And it works very, very well. And it's basically a single point search where the aircraft doesn't physically move over the ground anywhere, but you take the camera from straight down and you roll it up to the horizon. And then you physically turn the aircraft just by yaw about 20 degrees right or left and then you scan all the way from the horizon back down to the ground. And you continue this process up and down, up and down, up and down in a complete circle. So it, it's an aerial search of the area you happen to be in. Very good option. The problem was is that they, due to the miscommunication, he was only rolling the camera up so far to the lake and was not going all the way up to the horizon. And if he had, he would have had a very clear shot of where the uh, human analog happened to be. And he kept going around, going around, going around. And it was just back and forth communication. They were trying to get this figured out, that figured out. And eventually they actually ran low on power and to the point that they were going to have to recover the aircraft. So at that point, I gave him a couple hints of where they were going. And he rolls the camera up and sure enough, there's the, the target right on the edge of the screen. Clear as day. Uh, then he, he looks at me and he goes, well, if I would have ran my normal uh, search pattern, I would have found them on the second pass. Very true. And this is probably one of the biggest lessons is that when you come up with your initial search plan, follow it. Fly your plan or plan your flight and fly your plan. Because we go back to that whole coverage thing. We want to make sure that we're able to go and cover everywhere. And we don't miss anything. But the problem is being as cops and firefighters, Sometimes we get attracted by shiny things and we want to go see what that is. We see a target of interest and we want to go see what it is. And then we see another thing over in the distance and we want to go see what that is. The problem is, is we go from this nice organized search pattern where we're up and down, up and down, thorough, efficient. We're doing what we need to do to what looks like somebody took a ball of yarn and threw it on the ground. And now it's just a ball and it's just a mess. And now we've searched certain areas 10 times. We've searched other areas, none and we've got no set plan. The plan goes out the window. So 
I like throwing stress in there. Those of us in this, in the public safety industry, we know that scenario-based training is absolutely just imperative for our day-to-day -day jobs. Train as you fight, fight as you train. It's because that's how we end up making sure that when we do go out there in the real world, and this is actually happening, that we're able to go and fall back to that level of training. So when we have that high level of anxiety where with this one, we have an autistic male, okay? If you've gone through uh, training on what we consider abnormal psychology people is that very typically we see autistics are drawn to water. That's an issue because that's a hazard that they could potentially go and be either harmed or killed. Happened to be in this search area, we had water involved. So their first thought process is I need to go search that water because that's where they may be. Also only having one battery, again, it increases that stress level to where I really have to make this work, but I have to do it safely. So I'm not really pushing it. Plan your flight, fly your plan. That mission was going absolutely perfect up until the point that they started going and chasing shiny things. As soon as they went and started chasing shiny things, everything went off the rails at that point. So make sure that whatever you do, until you have solid intel that says, I need to go do something else, follow what you're actually flying because that's probably your best option. The lower altitude worked great. Uh, as soon as they brought it up, the image of a six foot tall uh, human on the screen Screen. We happen to be flying an iPad, a, a 9.7 inch iPad. Yeah, he was probably about three eighths to a half inch tall when they actually zoomed in on him. Very, very easy to find. So worked out very well on that side. So all in all, it was a great mission. Uh, every time that we do one of these scenarios, and I do these with my actual agency that I work for, always debrief, go over what went right, what went wrong, why it went wrong, and what we can do next time to go and make sure that that doesn't occur or to just simply make us more efficient to the point that we now run that mission the way that it should have been run. All right, uh, this is our two day. Um, we do a, a, a thermal camera operations and night operations course because the night operations is a whole different deal. Flying at night, you have reduced visibility. You really have to pay attention to what your hazards are. You need that visual observer to understand what they're looking at because now you're not looking at the aircraft as an airframe, you're looking at it as a series of blinking lights. So you wanna be able to really determine what you're looking at. How to set up a launch and landing area. Uh, we do use a lit landing pad that has orientation lights on it. So the aircraft can not only locate the landing pad, but is able to come back to the landing pad, reorient for landing, and then make a safe uh, vertical landing from there. So we do everything from start to finish. We all also go over 107.29 waiver and how to get that and then we also do the um, visual observer and pilot in command uh, course so then that way you can actually be signed off as a uh, FAA underneath the 107.29 you are now signed off as officially trained for night operations as a PIC or VO. Uh, on the thermal side we do run the Zenmuse XTs so we show you all the different options for that and we do have people that go out there so you understand what it looks like during daylight, what it looks like during nighttime, uh, what the camera limitations are, what its capabilities are, settings, color palettes, how to flip between color palettes and go. And you'll kind of find that thermal work actually becomes more of a art than it is a science. You really have to learn how to interpret the image that you happen to see in front of you because sometimes it's not as clear cut. Uh, then we move on to day two. And uh, on day two, uh, or sorry, we have this the other way, aerial search and rescue, day one, and then we do the night on day two. The uh, last agency I taught, we did it backwards, which actually worked out really well. Um, for aerial search and rescue in the morning, we do basically everything from search tactics, search patterns, uh, person behavior, because that becomes very important, because you have to understand what is a toddler gonna do versus a teenager versus an elderly person, where to start looking for them, uh, aircraft capability, aircraft systems, sensor systems, and then in the afternoon, we basically break up into groups. Normally, it's a, either a team of two or three, and they are given, similar to what you just heard with the simulated scenario mission that we ran, uh, they're given that mission, and it all varies. Basically, we just make it up on the fly based upon the environment we have, the types of calls that we get, so nobody gets an identical mission. And then the other teams are actually able to observe the team that is working it at that point in time. So everybody gets to learn from each other over each individual mission. So it works out very well for everyone to see how 
How they did it may not be the way that you agree how to do it. And you may do something different than them, or you may do something very similar because what they did happened to work. So works out very well. It's a really good time. Um, the agencies that we've trained, they felt that they definitely earned a lot of uh, information from it. And what they're now able to do is after they see the setup is that they're just going to continue with that and set up their own scenario based training. So then that way they can go out and do it themselves and keep sharp and keep those thought processes running. Uh, there's our schedule. So if anyone happens to be interested, um, in July, we're going to be in Boston and actually same month, we're actually going to be in Orlando. So in July, we have two of them set up. Uh, anyone that happens to be going out to Interdrone, uh, we're going to be about out that uh, way in Las Vegas on September 8th and 9th. And then uh, back up to Manchester, Connecticut, I'm actually heading up there next week to uh, work with one of their search and rescue groups. So we're going to be doing this same training for them up there. Uh, Houston in October and also Phoenix in October. So we're trying to hit basically the Northeast, Southeast, Southwest, and then other areas as we're able to. So with that, any questions? Uh, just want to open up the floor if anyone has anything, um, even outside of search and rescue, but just general public safety operations. Uh, more than happy to, to help out and give whatever information I can. Mike, we did get one question. Someone said, in the case of water rescue, are you using GPS location to notify the rescuers? And do your water, water rescue boats or jet skis have GPS as well? Depends on the resource. Um, yes, I do actually run Leachy. Um, anyone else that happens to run Leachy knows that it automatically gives you a latitude longitude. Um, jet ski, no GPS. FWC does have GPS. Um, so it is a very, very useful tool to have. You just have to understand what your ground units. Now, ground units, it even works better for them because as long as it, they have a cell phone, they have a GPS in their hand most likely and you can use the same coordinates to actually walk them onto target. So utilizing those GPS coordinates, that actually might have been something that they could have utilized in that scenario where he says, okay, I'm at this location, I am looking in this direction, and at least give him an idea of a possible coordinate to go over. So you just have to know what capabilities the other units happen to have. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, so that was actually the only question that we received. Um, so we'll just wrap things up for today. But um, thank you everyone for joining us. I'm sorry that we had some audio issues in the beginning, but thanks for sticking around. I will be sending out an email with a recording of this webinar as well as a copy of the slide deck. So keep an eye out for that. And also let us know if any other questions do come up. Um, our team has trained over 70 public safety departments and we'd be happy to help you guys out um, and start launching successful um, search and rescue missions. So thanks again. Thanks to Mike and have a great day. Thank you, everyone.